Well, thank you very much for that presentation. We have a, a lot to get done, so we are going to move right along now to hearing from Spark and Paul Krutko. So we're going to queue up a little video that deals with the issues that you just heard about that we use and to communicate to talent about why they should be here. So if we could play that, and then we'll do the presentation. There's a concept that springs forth from food called terroir, and that is that the food that is grown in a region is reflective literally of the earth that the plants that grow that fruit are planted in. And I think this area has that terroir to it. There is something that happens to the businesses and the people who live here that is actually born out of the, out of the earth, if you will. I think people have always thought about the University of Michigan first, but the fact is there's a fantastic business community here. There's just great intellectual leadership here. And it runs right up against a community that actually knows how to make stuff. The products that we produce, the products that we develop here are innovative, they're patented. We still see and have the same kind of ingenuity, entrepreneurship, and really strong engineering core talent that really allows us to create products that will change the world. We've been able to put in about a third less in capital than what the companies on the coast that would be doing exactly the same things would take. People here are extremely hardworking and very creative about how they get products developed. So they figured out ways to do it that just cost less to do. This is slides here. But we also found a very welcoming community uh, in Ann Arbor. Whether it was the surrounding businesses, or frankly, whether it was groups like Spark, people are attracted to Ann Arbor because of what it offers uh, as a community. This town helps me attract that town. This state helps me attract that town because they love being here. Our employees love coming to work. They're happy to live in Ann Arbor. It's a low cost of living with a high amount of happiness and with a Silicon Valley like culture. The thing I love about Ann Arbor is the fact that it is such a nice combination of being able to have a great work and family balance, being able to raise kids here in a great school system. The reason why I don't move to San Francisco and start out reading there is because I want my kids to grow up here in Ann Arbor. As a transportation hub, it's actually, it's actually spectacular. I mean, flying in and out of Detroit Metro around the world, we've got direct connections uh, from here into Asia, into, uh, into Europe, and even down into Latin America. You can get on one plane and get to virtually any part of the world uh, on a non-stop direct flight. That is an amazing asset for a community like us. We certainly have close connections to the state of Michigan uh, through one of our founders uh, and to the University of Michigan, but we really see great talent here in Michigan. Ultimately, it's about access to talent. That's what drives companies. That's how great companies continue to build and grow, and we've done really well with that here. There are a lot of universities here with a lot of really smart people developing a lot of really cool technologies. I think the future of Ann Arbor business is extremely bright. We are now being recognized as one of the entrepreneurial centers of the United States. In life sciences, in advanced manufacturing, um, in automotive research and development, um, and in IT. You've got all of the right ingredients. It's got the recipe for success with great research universities, a great talent pool, a business community that's savvy. For me personally, Pure Michigan says, welcome home. I think for a lot of people, maybe it even says, welcome back. And for anybody who's coming to visit or to stay, it just simply says, welcome. We'd love to have you here. So I was going to queue up my presentation. Um, you know, building on what Lou was saying, uh, those are the forces uh, in the United States. Um, what I would share with him, however, is the war for talent is going on across the entire country and across the entire world. And the community that gets it right will win. And New York has distinct advantages. But for example, when we have uh, Austin companies coming here saying we think there's talent here for our company, when Barracuda Networks locates here because they see a talent pool here. But then our own companies, Arbor Networks, has said, we can't find the talent here. 
So we got to look in Atlanta. You get a sense that what we have here is a talent shortage in America. Yes, the talent is moving, but we have issues to prepare enough talent to be successful. So what Spark is about, in contrast to what you just heard from Lou, is, is some intentionality about how to change our posture in our competitiveness as a region. So we're going to give you a brief regional update. And for some of the council members who I don't know very well, you know, who is this guy and why is he standing in front of you? Well, um, my uh, career arc has taken me from managing community development in the county around Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, for five years. I worked for the mayor of Cleveland for seven years doing economic development there. On to Jacksonville, Florida with the Jacksonville Partnership. And then 10 years in Silicon Valley. Uh, before I had the great privilege to be recruited here and to be the second CEO of Ann Arbor Spark. Uh, that's a 35-year career arc. So many of the forces that Lou's talking about, I've dealt with in a variety of settings around the United States in terms of Sun Belt communities, Rust Belt communities, high-tech communities. So what, what, what is Spark uh, and, and, and why is it important to this community? Well, you know, some ten, almost 10 years ago, uh, the leadership of the business, uh, government, and academic uh, communities here said we needed to do something different. We needed to be intentional about our future, and we needed to do that as a collective, not individually what the university would do or what the government would do, what the private sector would do. So Spark was formed um, uh, you know, seven years ago, um, and uh, we've had great success. This slide just to share with you that we're active. Um, we are uh, connected to other areas of innovation throughout the world. So we are tracking what our competitors are doing. And we're pleased to tell you that we are one of only 35 organizations globally that is as accredited uh, by its peers as an economic development organization. Mission statement you've seen. Uh, the key thing about our mission statement is we are focusing on companies that from the smallest early stage company to the largest, they're selling goods and services outside this region because we think the important thing for the economic health of this community is to grow the GDP. We have been, since our uh, initiation, focused on being an innovative economic development organization. And we do a lot of things that other organizations don't do and take on activities that are unique and dynamic. And the one that is very key is the notion uh, that Mike Finney coined when he was here, that we believe in open source economic development, which is we will engage in partnerships with anyone around the region to advance the region. And we believe that the economy is, is a regional economy. It is not governed by municipal boundaries. People move across these boundaries that were created in the 18th century uh, to uh, govern us. And that is not the key issue. The key issue is how our region competes with Atlanta, with Singapore, um, with, with, with um, uh, uh, locations in Europe. Um, we are, you know, uh, Rick uh, uh, Sheridan said it in the piece, but this is an indication that we are garnering attention. Uh, attention. Richard Florida uh, is, is, is well known, um, so is Tom Friedman. And uh, I really want to call your attention to the uh, Steve Blank quote, which is that Sil Silicon Valley is out of players. Don't start your company there, start it in Ann Arbor you'll find the talent that you need in Ann Arbor. We didn't pay him to do that. He said that at a conference in Silicon Valley. We just recently completed, with the help of uh, Steve uh, sits on um, our executive committee um, uh, and with other of our of the members of the private sector and uh, academic community who volunteer their time to be on Spark's executive committee and board of directors. We just completed a five-year strategic plan and this just gives you, it summarizes it in one page, and I would commend that to you later. But we are focused on three pillars uh, uh, based on leadership and planning, which is accelerating growth here, focusing on retention of talent and attraction of talent, and growing companies um, from the earliest stages. You know, th this is a slide that we use to explain why we take the approach that we do at Spark, uh, and that is that we focus on the top of the economy in terms of what we call driving industries. And these are some examples of the technologies that are important here that differentiate us from other regions in the United States. Why is that important? Because those kinds of companies sell goods and services outside our region. That brings uh, resources uh, back here, um, brings capital and wealth back here. It also, um, it also brings, uh, as Pat Doyle will tell you, 
uh, tremendous visitor uh, input from around the world who come here to visit those companies. Same with Teromo Hart that you heard. But underpinning all that, which I think is what the council wants to know, is what's the important thing for this, this city council to think about as it thinks about economic development. And I call your attention to these community success factors that unpin, underpins this. And the key ones are that we have as an efficient a business environment as we can, that we are working, as Lou pointed out, to create a world-class place that people want to be and live in. The stat that he told you I've heard for at least 10 years, so you know, CEOs for cities first uh, did the first survey, you're shaking your head, you know what I'm talking about, where, the, where they discovered that 65% of the young people are choosing where to live be, as opposed to who to work for. When I got out of school, you were trying to find a job and you'd move anywhere. That's not the case with the new generation. So place is important, and collaborative leadership is very, very important between all of the sectors to make this happen. Um, we believe that um, a growing economy is important because of the revenue it creates. And the revenue is important because it lets families be successful. That's the one bullet there, increased prosperity and opportunity. But it also creates revenue for you to invest that creates that vital community and that world-class place that attracts the talent and companies to locate here. So again, GDP grows by selling goods and services outside the region, and resilient regions have to grow their GDP. Um, all you have to do is look down the road at Detroit and understand that because that was a shrinking GDP, the resources weren't there to reinvest in that community. I commend this to you in your packet. We just put together sort of this infographic that touches upon how what we do at Spark affects the overall economy. Um, and I'll get to a little data in a minute. We, we agree with Lou uh, uh, in terms of his analysis, but we don't think our competitors uh, in this, this game are San Francisco and New York. Um, this is a uh, college-based innovation economy. And so the people that we feel we need to be comparing to ourselves to, he mentioned one of them, Madison. Uh, we've picked out this set. I'd be interested after the session to ask Lou what he thinks about this set, but Boulder, Madison, Corvallis, Palo Alto, Chapel Hill, and Evanston. This just shows you what happened in those communities um, in, the le in, in this most recent, uh, not cyclical uh, thing we've gone through, but a structural change in our economy. And you can see that we pretty much all followed the same curve. Some of the communities um, started at lower unemployment rates than we did. Uh, when they began, we went higher, uh, but we're having a dramatic change. And when you look at that same graph, uh, comparing Ann Arbor and those competitive sets to Michigan, which is the red line at the top, and to the United States, you can see that Ann Arbor has done well in that comparison uh, uh, as well. And so that's just a basic uh, uh, look at that. Here, this just takes a slice at Washtenaw County. Uh, the blue bar is Washtenaw County, the red bar is Michigan, the green is the United States. Um, as you can see coming out of the recession, we have done uh, better consistently in terms of the unemployment rates comparing to overall to the state of Michigan as well as the United States. And this is private sector employment. A lot of times when we have this conversation, folks talk about the university employment. What we're focused on here is the private economy. Um, GDP, and this, this underscores, I think, a point that Lou made in his presentation. Uh, this is the last year. So our GDP growth in Ann Arbor uh, was 3.2%. Uh, seven, over 7% 7 of that came from the knowledge-based economy. But also note that without the work that we are doing collectively as a community to grow that part of our economy, we would have gone the other direction because manufacturing is contributing almost 5% less in the last year to our overall GDP. Um, this is just a picture that shows you what, what has happened recently. This is just data um, from um, George Fulton. You can see how we went into the recession and what the job growth has been since we've come out. Um, and this is what we project to happen in the county. This is George Fulton's uh, data from the University of Michigan uh, moving forward. An important, important point in this, and I think for the discussion that you are having about a strategy is this is job growth in Washtenaw County. The question is um, how and what ways does the city of Ann Arbor capture its fair share of this job growth? This job growth is going to happen here uh, someplace in this county. Um, so there is a competition for jobs in this county in, in terms of, of that happening. Um, 
you're almost getting to the end here. This is just to give you a sense of what our work has been, and I appreciate Lou's comment about you know, that there's a fantastic economic development organizations. We think that we are one, but I think the state is important because if you think about Washtenaw County having 330,000 citizens, uh, impacting 13,000 jobs over this period is, is, are, is pretty good results, as well as the, the investment um, that's been made. So you say, well, that's great. That's what's happened in the region. What's happened in the city of Ann Arbor? These, this is the data uh, on the projects that we have worked on specifically in Ann Arbor. Uh, nearly 5,000 jobs, a uh, little over $2 million in investment. And then you can see some of the tools we use um, to make economic prosperity happen uh, in terms of certain projects. So what do we do? We focus on regional economic development. We focus on accelerating the growth of startups. Uh, we manage an investment fund for the entire state of Michigan. And we're actively trying to work on retaining, recruiting, and retraining talent. That's, that's the emphasis that we're placing on that. This is just what we do in terms of business development. So we are actively involved, and I'll, I'll skip through this in a second, because we're going to talk about Gen Z, which was a project that was before you just a few weeks ago, which is illustrative of the kind of work we do. But I think this is interesting for you to see, and it kind of does re reinforce what, what Lou was saying. Um, we go call on um, uh, numbers of companies um, on a daily basis throughout the year. This is what they're telling us as the situation right now. So if you kind of do bullet one, bullet two, bullet three, bullet four, all good, right? But 34% are saying to us, a third are saying their issue is aggressively looking for talent so they can make increased capital investment here so that they can sell goods and services from here so they can launch a new product. And the main feedback from downtown Ann Arbor businesses is that they need more space and they want that space to be downtown in a dense environment because to lose in point, that's where the employees want to be. So we just wanted to share with you quickly, um, this is a fun slide for us. We've been, been at this business um, uh, from the time that uh, Mike Finney was employee number one until the team that's here that we like to call Spark 2.0. Um, this is where the projects have happened year by year, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009. And I think you can see that Ann Arbor has done very well in this investment pattern. These are the companies that are growing here. These are new companies who have come and chose to come to Ann Arbor because they see a talent pool. One of the things that I would take a little exception to what Lou is saying about companies is companies are very targeted now. The big guys, some of these companies are looking, they may be looking for five or six specific people in a community, and they know that they're in that community. And that's sort of what this group represents. They are looking for specific talent that they've been able through whatever means of sifting data that they could find and decided that they wanted to look at Ann Arbor as a location. Um, almost to the end, um, David Packard, this is his quote, the founder of uh, Hewlett Packard. Um, and Mahindra Gen Z is a good example, I think, of a very prudent decision that this council made a few weeks ago because Mahindra is one of the largest uh, manufacturing companies in the world. And for them to choose because of the talent pool here to develop the electric scooter project that they are going to launch across the United States from here uh, says a lot about what they see as the advantages of locating here in the talent pool that's there. We're very proud of this project. This is, this is a, if we all think about what happened with um, borders, uh, the fact that we've been able to refill this building um, with uh, a high technology company from Silicon Valley who says they are here because the talent is here and their growth is going to happen here, not in Silicon Valley. And you see the quote from their CEO. And that quote was not to us, to the Ann Arbor.com. It was to the Silicon Valley Business Journal. Uh, we think that's important because Liberty Street has come back. Uh, Menlo's there, Barracuda's there, Prime Research is there, Google, MyBuys. The reason that that street and the adjacent streets are coming back in terms of restaurants and retail is because we have the foot traffic from these businesses. And those businesses are trying to get into every nook and cranny along those streets and tops of those buildings and everywhere they can stick in. I think where Rich Sheridan is. He's, he's, Menlo Innovation is underneath a parking garage. 
Why? Because it's so important for them to be in downtown. So this question about how we get more office space in downtown is critical to our economic future. We work a lot in startups. Um, that's what Spark is really known for. Um, what I wanted to share with you is that one of the advantages that happened because Spark was created um, was we developed the capabilities um, to manage uh, an investment program that the state of Michigan decided that they wanted to implement in the state. So that's the pre-seed fund. Um, we've made 94 investments across the state, but what I wanted to share with you tonight is 35 of those investments have been in Ann Arbor. And nearly $7 million investment, those companies have raised $44 million in private uh, investment and another $18 million in grants, and their annual sales right now are nearly $10 million. These are the start some of the names of the startups uh, that we uh, think have a great potential. But as Lou did point out, and I, I, this is good dialogue because he made a lot of key points, the, the, the issue for us at Spark and the issue I think for the community is how we can retain these companies and grow, uh, that they don't uh, get to a point where they don't see the talent availability um, and they decide that they need to be in Boston or they decide that they need to be in New York or some other location. Uh, this is just in one example of one of our uh, signature entrepreneurial successes that we've helped with every level of support that we have. Um, they are now uh, moving forward and being fairly uh, successful. Um, those are the kids that, that talent, that millennial talent uh, that Lou was speaking to. Take a look at that picture. Uh, because of the work we're doing with them, they're here and they're developing this company here in downtown Ann Arbor. Uh, lastly, and this is to close out the presentation, we are, we are the external um, voice for this community uh, to uh, the Midwest, um, to the nation, and to the world. Um, we're focused on this notion of that we're a connected region to the globe. Um, this is sort of what's happened relative to the uh, improvements we've made and rework of our website, where we are in terms of social media um, and, and else, elsewhere. Um, just a couple you know, things we, that we've had tremendous pickup now in national news media coverage about uh, the work we're doing in Ann Arbor. Uh, and so we think that, that we're getting traction with our messaging. So that's it. Um, I'd be happy to take you know, any questions that you have about what Spark does and uh, how we uh, can work collaboratively with uh, the city of Ann Arbor. We do have time uh, for a few questions for Paul, if you have them. Also, Lou is still here as well. Yeah, Lou's here as well. Uh, we're actually moving along uh, pretty well tonight. Remember, we try to get out of here by 9 o'clock, if we can. Well, Lou, I have a, uh, I want a question for you. Um, one of the things that uh, you've been around town and one of the things you've seen over the last few years, we've had the building of some, build, uh, some taller buildings which will house several of them developed to house students. But yes. also quite a few of them have components within them, one and two bedrooms uh, units rather than your large four bedroom units. I, don't, I just want to make sure you notice that the building that recently opened at first in Washington is not geared towards students at all. Yeah. It's rented out. Our new superintendent of schools, in fact, uh, want to be oh, right? and lives there. That's so great. we are, uh, what's going to be coming back to us very soon is, is a zoning change, and we're going to try to move away from the four-bedroom footprint the th even and have a minimal number of threes and go towards efficiencies, ones and twos. Yeah. And I wanted to get your opinion on that. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I'm... Uh I mean, this, you know, this generation, at, at least before they have kids, wants dense neighborhoods. And we in Michigan don't know what dense means. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot denser than, than we've ever thought of. And, and we've got to have more of it. The other thing I think is worth pointing out is they want dense rentals. They're not buying. So if you, I mean, if, you know, there's this notion that renters are bad for neighborhoods. If you think that, you're getting no millennials. Uh, before they have kids, they want to rent. So, um, I mean, that's that's the other sort of change in policy that we're going to have to think about. So, the higher the density, the better. the The other thing, I, you know, a lot of my friends have kids who are in New York or Chicago, and they all think their kids are nuts because of what they're paying for housing. And I keep telling them, 
which, which I think you need to think about is they're not paying high housing prices for the housing. They're buying the neighborhood. Central Park is worth a lot. Um, so it is, and at the moment, what Michigan is missing most, we are missing dense housing, we're missing the neighborhood that people are willing, and that includes Ann Arbor. So these 24-7 neighborhoods with high amenities, with high services is what, is what millennials are, college-educated millennials are looking for, and that's what, this, that's, that's what Michigan's going to have to do, including Ann Arbor. And, and transit's probably a big part of that. At the, so, I don't, you know, you guys are here. I mean, I live here, and I have a chance to talk to a lot of the professional schools at U of M, and all of them, I mean, it's amazing. This is such a generational change. Tell me at the top of their list when they're thinking about where to live is, do I need a car? They do not want a car, and if you don't have transit, you're toast. I mean, they're not coming. So transit, transit, transit is really important. Any other questions for Lou? Mike? I have one uh, for Mr. Glazer, basically, I think, because he was early on you mentioned personal freedoms. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the things that Michigan needs to do most dramatically is to move on these issues. Me too. Uh, we have a real paucity of uh, rights, human rights in our state. And people mm -hmm. will leave just because of that. We knew we lost professors at the University of Michigan. There's a talent drain going on here yeah. for these very reasons. And I think those who have the ear of the governor and the legislators should speak to this because we can have a really nice place for retirees and have some things that are really nice, but we won't attract the real talent unless we have a mind change in Michigan. So when you speak of my Michigan, it should be mind Michigan. And all of us should be aware of that. Exactly. Well, welcoming matters. And, you know, talent comes in every human dimension. And if you're not welcoming, they're not coming. So, but, you know, from an Ann Arbor perspective, it's one of yeah. the things that the city's terrific at. The, yeah, I mean, it's, the state's not so good. Councilmember Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Glazer. And Mr. Krakow uh, is very informative. And certainly the alignment of, uh, of uh, prosperity with education yeah. attainment and the percent of knowledge-based uh, jobs is intuitive and, and, and born out of the, the data and it's something we should all be working to improve. Um, and I understand that the data don't move um, quickly, but I'm wondering um, what sort of specific metrics um, you look at to see if Michigan and, and the metro areas are in fact making progress in this regard. Well, you know, I mean, if, 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 if our, um, you know, basic analysis of what's driving the economy is right, the metric that matters most is the proportion of it all to the four-year degree. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, we're in the mid-30s in college attainment, and that's trumping everything at the moment. So uh, it, it's just that we have to, and, and so, and... <laughs> Michigan's challenge is on both sides of the equation. We're not doing a great job of preparing talent, and then we're not doing a great job of retaining and attracting talent. So we got to work on both of them. And at the, you know, so you know, get into Lansing politics a little bit. So the two things that probably matter most are investing in your education system, and we've spent sort of a decade uh, slaughtering it and creating quality of place, and the other thing that's been slaughtered is revenue sharing. These things don't make any sense if you want to grow the economy. So, um, you know, we, we're going to have to value talent a lot more than we have historically in our policies, uh, or else we're going to be one of the poorest states in the country, which would be a real shame after going through 100 years when we were in one of the most prosperous places on the planet. Are there any things, thank you, that um, other metros, college towns like us that are that are uh, that are doing that are particularly innovative to oh. uh, or effective in drawing talent? I mean, do do we, I don't know, do, um, the spark and um, I mean, do, do these do our economic development organizations in the various communities you just talked about, business, government, mm -hmm. acad are we working like I don't know, say at the 
business school when uh, the business schools when companies right. come in to recruit people so that we can make our pitch to oh. keep them oh. here yeah I mean I, I just you know if you look I mean I other than Corvallis I thought the list that you had I didn't really know much about Corvallis yeah you know. but I, th I thought the list was fine but I mean I think in general the places that are doing best have have these neighborhoods that uh, the housing and neighborhoods that people are looking for and that's the weird thing about it is it's it's we know how to do that stuff it's not sort of we got to invent something new you know we know transit matters let's just do it for, you know for god's sakes or density matters so i don't think it's i don't think the formula is unknown it is you know that there has been a lack of political willingness to do it uh here and in and across the state so so what i would share with you is that there are a number of specific intervention strategies um, about getting um, to the students at an early uh, point. Um, if you're waiting until they're juniors or seniors, um, you're going to have problems. So we have had, uh, supported by the county, uh, that was Mary Jo's here, uh, we ran a pretty extensive internship program for freshmen last year. Uh, we showed them the kind of opportunities that they would have if they lived here. We also showed them the kind of job opportunities that, that are here. While I agree that, and it's true, kids move because uh, for place, they also are confident when they go to that place that there's a job that fits the kind of work they want to do. And one of the things that we need to do a better job, particularly with our private sector employers, is that some of them are exceptionally good at recruiting here and keeping people here so you know we highlight rich sheridan all the time you know he's a rock star in terms of just entrepreneurship in the in, in the nation in the world he doesn't have any trouble recruiting here and keeping young people here um, we're running lots of kids through google um, uh, so um, other of our employers have problems so what we're trying to dissect working with um, rose Blanca at the community college is you know what's the difference? Why why are some employers good at this and some employers aren't as good at that? Um, and also this notion that kids think that you know um, you know one of the reasons why people gravitated to Silicon Valley was just what I just said. You know if that company that I'm working for goes under, there's five or six other places where I can get a job, and, and so they sense that the job pool is there. I think our job pool is here, just kind of reinforcing that because we're having a talent shortage. So communicating to the kids, but, but he's hit on a, a really key point. They tell us they want to live in the downtown, they want to live in tall buildings, they want to have a 24-7 environment. If we, can't, if we can't deliver that kind of environment, um, they will look elsewhere. Thanks. Councilmember Breer. Mr. Kutko. Mr. Glazier, I, I don't really care which of you speaks to this issue. Um, looking at your maps of where um, young professionals live, and going further than just those two maps, um, it's clear to me that in other metropolitan areas, they live in the big city. But in our metropolitan area, the big city is pretty empty still of young professionals. And Ann Arbor has a lot of capacity, but it doesn't have the geographic capacity to rival a Detroit or a Chicago, or frankly a Madison. Um, because it, uh, Ann Arbor regionally does, but Ann Arbor specifically has, has geographic uh, restraints that are, I'm going to say self-imposed, imposed by agreement, by treaty years and years ago. Um, that, that would limit our ability to grow horizontally. So in this kind of a situation, regional strength is as valuable, if not more valuable, yeah. than just strength within the city limits. Yeah. How do we help the region grow so that Ann Arbor itself doesn't have to become 100-story buildings? Right. So, I mean, I, you know, look for, um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly believe that uh, Ann Arbor is part of Metro Detroit, uh, whether people in Ann Arbor want to believe that or not. Uh, I mean, if you really look at sort of labor market patterns and where people come from, it is. So, yeah, I mean, the, so 
so if you're talking about a metropolitan area of almost 5 million people, the city of Detroit has to be a talent magnet, period. Ann Arbor can't substitute for that. Uh, you know, and which means that sort of all of us are going to have to understand that, that it's in all of our interests to have Detroit succeed uh, and stop disinvesting in it. And, uh, you know, and secondly, you know, I would argue that sort of the probably the most important thing that we can do at a, at a regional level to make the region work is transit again. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, we're the only big metro in the country that doesn't have a rail transit system. This is not smart. Um, having said that, um, you know, I think Ann Arbor can, Ann Arbor can be one of those uh, places within the region that, uh, that is a talent magnet and is an entrepreneurial center rivaling Madison. I don't see any reason why it can't be as competitive as Madison. I think we've just chosen not to be, uh, you know, and it's, uh, that can be reversed. So, um, you know, the best thing to have happen is for both Detroit and Ann Arbor to work. You know, to be talent magnets, and at the moment, uh, both aren't. But for five million people in Southeast Michigan, this ain't working unless Detroit works. Councilmember Pearson. Thank you. Um, I think this question is for Paul, probably. So I hear a lot about the need to attract the young urban millennials to the downtown area. They're desirous of a 24-7 neighborhood. Um, suppose we were to make that happen. What is the risk of frustrating, annoying, driving away all the families that live in the non-24-7 neighborhoods, but also within the city of Ann Arbor? How do we balance the need to sort of preserve the neighborhoods that we think of as more traditional neighborhoods with this new sort of millennial 24-7 nonstop energy downtown? Well, I think that there are plenty of examples in the United States where you have a vibrant core downtown in adjacent uh, what used to be called streetcar neighborhoods that were developed in the 20s with, you know, that's uh, detached single family housing that was on, used to be on uh, transit and trolley before, you know, it was all taken out. So I don't think that, the, that there aren't models that show how uh, a vibrant downtown can coexist uh, with uh, quality neighborhoods. Um, I think you even, to some extent, use, using the Chicago example, you can see that in the neighborhoods that are directly adjacent to the core downtown. Um, you know, I recently took a, took a bike tour because that's what I do in cities because um, that's how I think you can see the most. And you can see that in Chicago. You know, you get out of, out of the loop and you are running into um, quality neighborhoods that people, as I think Lou's making a really good point, which I want to reinforce, that first location decision is really critical uh, because then they can find the other as their, their change. The one thing I will tell you, though, that is, a, is, is maybe, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say a needle in the haystack or, or what, what sort of adage I want to use, there are a lot of people that go to school here um, that we encounter in the companies we're working with who when they get to child rearing age say, you heard Jan said, I want to come back to Ann Arbor. And what they want to know is, are, are the jobs in the field that I have now advanced myself five, six, seven years in, do those jobs exist in Ann Arbor? And we, we see a lot of that. You know, the, the state was running and shut down a program that we thought had a lot of merit, which was the Michigan program where they were using the alumni database. They were going to other regions where we have concentration of alumni and telling them the story about how they could raise a family in Ann Arbor and have the successful career. And it got a lot of resonance. Um, the state decided they wanted that that wasn't quite the approach they wanted to take. We're, in terms of our planning, uh, one of the things that we want to try is a similar kind of program in nearby metros, looking at where um, Michigan alumni are in Indianapolis, back in Chicago, uh, and sort of making that case. Um, so I think that's the way I would answer the question, Sally. I think there's plenty, there's plenty of good um, examples, uh, the good planning practices, good design practices, that show how the, that interface, and I think what you're really talking about is where the dense downtown inter, intersects with guess, the neighborhoods. I guess my question is, what are the specific, sorry, what are the specific benefits that can be yielded to the neighborhoods by virtue of having 
millennials downtown? I mean, well, we don't, I well, guess. Well, the tax, you know, the, the let's, tax use, base, let's yeah. use Barracuda as a, as a key example. Board, that Borders failed. Borders is gone. That was the headquarters store. On its valuation, on the county tax rolls, the valuation goes down. This community and all the other taxing jurisdictions get less money. Now that it's filled up with 400 Barracuda employees, the value of that property goes up. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit about the LDFA. The LDFA, if you look at the trend lines of the LDFA, it shows you that your downtown is growing in taxable value. That's revenue that this council gets to spend uh, on quality of life. You get to decide where those dollars are spent. Yeah, well, it's not only that. I mean, it is all the amenities that come with high density, right? I mean, 60-year-olds like nice restaurants, too. So <laughs> no people know nice restaurants. So um, shops and everything else, I mean... So uh, there's got to be a way that the boomers and the millennials can live together, right? I mean, or, or, or else <laughs> communities aren't going to work. And, uh, and Michigan's problem at the moment is, is that um, not only we're less educated in the country than the country, but we're aging faster in the country. And we gotta, we're going to have to figure this out. So if, if our politics is if the boomers don't like it, we're not going to do it. It ain't good for the long-term health of the of the community, but it ain't good for them either. Well, my millennial moved out uh, quite a, a few years ago, and we're sort of happy he hasn't come back. <laughs> <laughs> but we like no, he's here. We like having him around. Great. We like having him around, just not at our house. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Taylor, Mr. Glazer. Uh, speaking of. Um, Understanding that, uh, that uh, the, the state and the region have made choices that you've suggested are perhaps not conducive to, uh, to economic growth, um, uh, you know, the city uh, exists in that context uh, and as a consequence is not a, uh, does mm -hmm. not have complete control over its destiny. Sure. Uh, but, but surely there are things, uh, and perhaps this is putting you on the spot, that, that we have done or could do or should do uh, that would advance us or things that what would you have, uh, the short answer, the short question, I guess, is what would you have us do differently or better, this council? Um, so two things. One, I would, um, I would adopt uh, Mayor Emanuel's approach to economic development. I mean, talent should be the priority. Yeah, exactly, at least here. You, you got 40. Maybe, maybe got 11 40. of them. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. You got um, 40,000 of the of the resources that everybody on the planet wants, figure out how to keep them. I mean, that that's number one priority. Number two is create quality of place. I mean, have policies that are that are that are creating the quality of place that they want. So rent renter friendly, given that they want to rent that own, density friendly, amenity friendly. I mean, these are things the city can do. And as the mayor mentioned, at the top of that list is transit, transit, transit. You know, and once again, something you can do. Thank you. Uh, two points. First of all, uh, you mentioned can the boomers and the millennials get along. I've, over the last couple months, I've had so many conversations with my peers, try, and their, their, their parents, their empty nest, sometimes retirees, sometimes near retiree parents, and they're all saying, can we get into can the Ann Arbor City too? Apartments? Can yeah. we get into these buildings no, exactly. that are coming in near Cary Town? I see, a, in terms of talent attraction, that's one of the things I'm concerned about is a lot of the better new development we're seeing in the downtown, I'm seeing empty nesters Going to who can outbid yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. a young talent yeah, yeah. for it. Um, so that, that's, you know, that's, um, that's Manhattan and Brooklyn, right? So, so you, I mean, that's, that's this, in the really successful places, the millennials are ending up near downtown, not downtown, because downtown gets too expensive. Which gets, and wonderful segue to my second point. The concern that, one of the concerns that I have is we've talked about this, you know, great economic prosperity, increase uh, median wage, increase median income, bring more people into our community because we've got all these great amenities which does push cost of living up, which does co push housing costs out, which does push people aside. Can you talk to me a little bit about the equity concerns and how to address and mitigate those? Um, yeah, look, there, 
there um So Ann Arbor may be the only place in the state where sort of gentrification, I mean, most places, most cities in Michigan have have so much sort of vacant and excess property that, that they're not running into that problem at the moment, so they need more rather than less. I mean, here, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, um, so, you know, we've ended up never correcting for cost of living because we think that cost of living is sort of half the equation. It's what you get for your money, right? And people people will pay more for higher quality. I mean, that's why millennials are moving to high-cost places like Manhattan and Chicago. So, but sure, I mean, at some point, it, it, it does push people out. And at the moment, no one's figured, no one's figured that out, uh, sort of how you, it's a balancing act. So, and, and it's pretty difficult to figure out. Um, I, I guess what I would argue is is that um, uh, even in Ann Arbor, I don't know if we've reached the point. Um, you know, I, I would certainly end up on the side that um, of of trying to figure out how you get more growth and uh, and more density, uh, even though if it gets to the right scale, you are going to create gentrification issues. But I, I think at the moment the balance is 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 on um, ways in favor of growth rather than trying to slow growth because of gentrification. We, we can share with the council data against the competitive set that shows what our comparative cost of living is with the other places that we've been talking about that we're competing with. And generally versus the coasts, we're a third less um, in terms of uh, what it costs to live here to have a high quality of life versus those places. And that's why some of the companies that we showed you that we've had a lot of success with are sort of doubling down on this location uh, because, it, and Jan Garfield said it as well, the burn rate for companies here is much less. So if you invest in a company here because of the cost of doing business is significantly less than the coast, that venture capital investment goes longer. The same thing happens for an individual. An individual can um, have a much higher quality of life. We, we estimate a 33% higher quality of life for the same dollar here versus Austin, Texas, versus you know Boston versus the Bay Area. So there's still, I think, getting to the point that Lou's making, there's still room in this in, in, in here in terms of um, our ability uh, to not create that effect. Well, and it's probably the same um, equation that it's been for a long time. So the city and the county have been studying this for a long time, but particularly in the city of Ann Arbor, you're not going to have affordable housing that isn't subsidized in some way. So it's just the dynamic. Council Member Peterson. Um, this is for either one of you, but um, I wanted to share the story of when we visited Menlo with Rich Sheridan, and we were, the mayor and I were talking to their employees, all of whom I think were young urban professionals, most of whom lived in Ypsilanti and commuted in. To what, to what extent do you think Ypsi, Ypsilanti City could become our Brooklyn? It can. It can. That's the answer. And... Exactly. Well, yeah, you gotta have it. Exactly. I mean, if 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 you think so, I I've always argued for um, however you define this region, but certainly for the county, the corridor that matters is the corridor between Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. And if it's, it, both cities have a role to play. If it's dense and connected by transit, this county does a heck of a lot better than it's doing now. So Ipsy matters a lot. Well, Rich asked the question that day how people got to work. Yeah. They and. Um, over half raised their hand and said they rode the bus. Uh -huh. And then there was another third that, uh, that walked or rode a bike, and there was about one third that drove a car. Right. Council Member Long? Just to follow on at a recent and, DDA And, and that third doesn't want to drive a car. Yeah, yeah. they don't want to drive it. <laughs> at a recent DDA partnerships meeting, Al McWilliams shared that the vast majority of his employees uh, live in Ypsilanti. They work here. They'd love to live here. I uh, can't. Quite afford it, afford I guess. it, yeah. And but I'm wondering too, how can we spark the economic development on the other side of 23? I mean, I drive Washna daily. I mean, we all do, and you know, it's we're fortunate. It's booming over here. You know, Arbor Hills, they're they're uh, outperforming their revenue expectations, uh, three or four percent, I guess. I mean, it's great to see that vibrancy and that growth. The minute you cross under 23. Uh, you just see all these vacant parcels, and 
Um, I mean, how, see, Wendy sitting there and, but you know, it's like, how can we? That's a, that's a question oh. for, yeah. for Paul. Yeah. I, think, I think one of the things that, that is important when we talk about what we do um, is we are a regional economic development mm -hmm. organization. So when we get prospects, when Luke Bonner is working with somebody on wanting to grow, expand, or come here, we're agnostic about the sites. What we want is mm -hmm. the best possible site for the company. Mm -hmm. So when you see that those effects, what you're seeing is that once a company has made a decision or someone's made a decision to make an investment here, they're choosing what's the best place in Washtenaw County right now to make an investment. Um, what I've shared with our county friends, um, because that's a key partnership for us in the other side of 23, which there's a lot of energy behind the Eastern Leaders Group and a lot of things we're trying to do over there, supporting with, with Mary Jo, is, is what we find is um, while many people, many people in elected positions don't like to talk about incentives, um, at least in the context of local um, decisions, um, sometimes it takes incentives to get a company to locate where someone else hasn't. Um, companies are like, like the folks we're talking about. They want to feel that they're in a comfortable environment uh, for their employees. So if you kind of look at, you, you mentioned going on the other side of 23, let's talk about um, you know, sort of the activity that's going on in Pittsfield Township. Look at the activity that's going on in Sio Township. Uh, companies are making significant investment decisions. We're seeing a lot of vacant buildings being filled up in Pittsville Township in particular. Um, so, so there is differences between you know, what each of those communities mm -hmm. is willing to do. Um, and some of the communities in our county are pretty aggressive about what they want to do. But again, Sparks Roll, we're, we're, all we're trying to do is get, put the company in front of right, who, right. who can make that decision that will help them. Well, it's good you're agnostic, I guess. Yeah. And um, I mean, obviously, we're Ann Arbor elected officials want to come to Ann Arbor and want you, you know, to, to do all that you can to attract that talent here. But obviously, it's it's more of a regional, as you, as you said, the, um, when you talk about open source economic development, it's um, it's not determined by municipal boundaries. We all. We all benefit. If I could just one question about, because you kept mentioning Madison, and I'm just trying to think, you know, okay, what is Madison doing? Because they've, they've, you know, they're growing twice as fast as the national average. We had no growth over that seven or eight year period. Um, and this first, this whole concept that the first location decision is so critical. I'm glad to hear that you're working with. So, so answering your question, you know, part of this, when you, when you play the comparison game, between jurisdictions, you have to kind of factor in everything, right? So let's remember, uh, University of Wisconsin is there, but so is the state capital. Right. It's like when people, we compare ourselves to Austin, right? Well, mm -hmm. it's UT and the state capital. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, several engines there. You know, why is Columbus growing like Topsy? Because uh, there's some certain location um, factors. One thing I will tell you anecdotally that we want to study working with the university and Ken Nesbitt and his team is that uh, we think that Madison's been very successful in creating science park development. So a lot I'm of sorry, science park development. Oh. So they have been more aggressive um, and they are branded University of Wisconsin parks and companies want to be in that kind of environment. Now just think we have the greatest research mm -hmm. university in the United States, and if you think about it, there isn't a technology park in this community. Um, whether it's in Ann Arbor or it's in one of the adjacent communities, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. So we've been, in our dialogue at Spark with the university, we've been talking about how can, you, how can we make that happen. Again, if a, if a company gets to scale and is looking, this is a challenge for us right now, for my team, and they say, I want 50,000 square feet, and I want it to be in a vibrant location, we we don't have product. Tech campus downtown? We don't have product. Yeah. So um, I'm very heartened in one of the things I've offered Steve. Um, we, we believe we have uh, the potential for tenants um, for the project that you just approved that supposedly is, uh, as I understand it, is a mixed office and residential. Um, and so we'd like to get into dialogue with uh, the developer um, and kind of see if we can we can make a project happen there with some new development mm -hmm. that would be office and, and would house new jobs. Yeah, Paul's referring to the old Y lot. Mm -hmm. well, uh, thank you, Paul, and, and 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 thank you, 
Lou for joining us tonight. And I think we need to move on to our next segment, but uh, we hope to have you back. If that's not too daunting a challenge, but we'll, we'll get, maybe it'll be a year, but we, we'd like to have you back. And I know you both are available at, at different forums around town, too, for council members who'd like to attend and learn more. But thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on now to the uh, Smart Zone LDFA update, and we have our own CFO, Tom Crawford, to start that out. Good evening, Mayor. Actually, if I can introduce you to the chair of the um, LDFA, she's actually going to be doing the presentation. Ms. Carey, how do you see your last name? Leahy. Leahy, thank you. So, and, and I didn't plan this, but actually I grew up in Michigan. I went to University of Michigan undergrad. I met my husband in Chicago, lived there for 10 years. He grew up in Wisconsin, went to University of Wisconsin-Madison. And when we were having our first child in 2004, we were looking at Ann Arbor and Madison, and we chose Ann Arbor, so. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I guess we don't totally fit the mold, though, because we were having children. So he was talking about before and after, but I just thought we didn't plan that, so. I'm the current chair of the LDFA, and I joined about a year ago, replacing Teresa Carroll, who is an outgoing member of the board. I was recruited um, as an, I'm an attorney by trade. I'm a corporate lawyer. And so I was recruited onto the board to be able to help the board review contracts, things like that, help them interpret issues that came up. You know, we have a mixture of people on the board that we'll kind of talk about, but that was my role when I was brought on. So I've been with them for about a year now. I was named chair last quarter, and I have been working to, you know, get to know more about the smart zone and LDFA in that time, and so we can go forward and talk about a couple of the issues. Now, I know that a lot of you have seen this presentation before, but there are also a lot of new members, and so we thought it would be helpful to go through some of that history, and I can just highlight on some of the topics. But. The smart zones, here you see there's a map up on the left side. Back in 2001, there were 11 smart zones. There's now 15 of them. Smart zones were created through a public act, and the goal was for these technology parks and to push technology-related businesses so that we could diversify the Michigan economy. That was one of the major pushes for these smart zones. And so um, initially, we were... Um, formed. You can see we got our smart zone status in 2001. There's a process in the statute that lists how this all comes to be. So the first one is that we have adoption of resolutions. That was between Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. That was in 2002. There was an initial appointment of an LDFA board. There's an LDFA plan that governs the entity and how it works. That plan includes a, a TIF plan and a development plan. So the TIF boundary, as you can see, is the existing DDA boundary. And the plan calls for capture of incremental taxes. Right now, there are taxes captured in Ann Arbor. There aren't taxes captured in Ypsilanti. So the dollars that are spent through this smart zone are in Ann Arbor where the dollars are captured. If Ypsilanti were to capture taxes, they would also um, have the right to use smart zone funds in their area as well. So the way we view this is that it is state funds that are distributed locally here in Ann Arbor because under the statute, the area is made whole through the state reimbursing. So the state covers those captured taxes. Last but not least, and we'll touch upon this at the end, the LDFA is, uh, has a defined scope and duration, which ends in 2018. And so there's obviously just a few more years, and we're starting to talk about what that means. So as I touched on, there's legal authority for the entity. Starts at the, the very highest level. There's the statute. Then there's the agreement between Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. There's the plan and the bylaws. You guys have the slides, you know, you've, you've read through them, but these are the governing documents for us. So the LDFA works within these documents. The ones that touch upon our day-to-day -day operations the most are the bylaws, you know, it tells us how many members we can have, who our officers are, what our duration of our terms are, things like that. But we also have a contract that we'll talk about a little bit um, later with our service provider. 
So we have um, nine board members. So Sally Hart Peterson's our, our newest member, and she's replacing Chris Taylor, who's our outgoing city council member. And we'll we'll officially welcome Sally tomorrow at tomorrow's meeting. But um, under our bylaws and our governing documents, we have nine members. So six are from Ann Arbor. There's three from Ypsilanti. We also have uh, three members that are non-voting. So Tom Crawford attends our meetings. Skip Sims from Spark attends our meetings. And Paula Sorrell from MEDC attends our meetings. And so they can weigh in on various issues from the city's perspective, the MEDC's perspective, and some from Spark's perspective. But overall, our board governs our operations and the oversight of, of what we do. We have a mixture, as you can see, of entrepreneurs, of industry experts, of people that are familiar with economic development, and then, you know, lawyers. Chris was on the board. He was, you know, also a lawyer by trade, but Teresa was a corporate lawyer as well. So there's a, a good mix of people on the board. So some of these services that are provided, and, and the whole smart zone, the premise of it is to provide these business acceleration services. So we have a list here of the types of services that are provided, and those are provided by Spark under a contract that the LDFA has with Spark. These services um, range from the networking events, which could be an event where startup companies can come and group, you know, meet in a group setting and talk about insurance issues or marketing strategies or business plan development strategies. There's a big range of types of events. There's entrepreneurial training, which could, um, you know, again, range from marketing roundtable events to um, how to attract uh, and, and gain some talent maybe to focus on some of the things that Lou was talking about. The, these services are grouped into different phases in our contract and so we'll talk about that on the next slide. But to highlight a couple of the other ones, the microloan program, just so you know, that's now self-funding. I know there were a couple of questions about that program and the line item being zero for it in our budget. The reason it was zero is because the microloan program is now self-funding. So when there's loans made, they're made out of funds that have been repaid to that program. But there's also, I think one of the key topics that I hear about from entrepreneurs that they like is the venture capital and angel investor preparation and introductions. So that's helping our companies that are here, our startups that may not have some of the sophistication in dealing with national venture capitalists or even some of the state venture capitalists to prep them for those meetings when they're talking about how do I get money to stay funded and stay here. So the the services are geared towards helping them walk through all those various steps so that they're comfortable taking those steps and they're successful in doing it. So as I mentioned, the LDFA contracts for these business acceleration services with Spark. So they're the entity that's providing the services. The LDFA is the oversight for that. So we're reviewing the contracted services and we get reports on these services on a quarterly basis and then also we have annual reports as well. These reports track to our budget, they show the numbers of companies that they've helped, they show um, incubator tenants, they show how many events have gone on, so we're able to track and, and look at the various contracted services that have been provided. On this slide, I just want to highlight the incubator space. We recently, this year, uh, approved expansion of the space that Spark had over at uh, 330 East Liberty, and they were able to open up that space for more tenants because that was one of the driving questions that a lot of uh, startups had is we need the space, we need access to good usable space that we can get into and not have to sign a you know two-year lease for. and turn over our firstborn child and um, not worry about that. So that was something that we approved this year and it was, I, I think it's been successful and companies have really taken, not taken advantage of it, but they, they've um, enjoyed using that space. One of the things they always talk about is the meeting space. They wanted some place where they could have real conference room type settings to host official business meetings, not at Starbucks or Espresso Royale. So that was a, a has been a positive. Um, 
as I mentioned, the LDFA contracts for these services, you should have a copy now of our contract with Spark, so you can see in there it details all of this and it tracks to a budget. So, um, and, and then it tracks to reports that we get as well. So the business accelerator services that are described in the contract are broken out into phases. This slide that you guys have in your packages details those different phases. I think the best part of this slide is really the top, which shows that these services are provided from a very early stage company until those companies are ready to move out and operate more independently because they've made it through those different phases. They may not be there for every phase, they might just be there for parts of them, but that's the push is to get them ready to go and able to operate on their own. And I, I think that's the, the, when they can do that, that's the, the real success. And to key on that, we have one of the entrepreneurs that Spark has been working with recently. He's just gonna come up and talk for a couple minutes about some of the services that his company, Message Blocks, uh, was able to uh, use through this program and some of the success that he's gotten from it. So I'll welcome Len up and he can talk for a couple minutes and then I'll finish up with our presentation. I'll just right. right here. Hi, I'm Len Gogger. I'm the founder and CEO of Message Blocks. Um, it was about three years ago I was sitting in my nice cushy office in DC and I had this idea for something. And I always wanted to move back to Michigan and be with my family again and um, quit my job and move back here. Um, and I set out on this kind of journey to find the right place for me to start my growing company or my idea I had in my head. Um, I hit a lot of the, the incubators throughout the state. So Lansing, Detroit, uh, Oakland County, Grand Rapids, and I finally kind of stumbled along to Ann Arbor Spark. It's where I sat down and I met with them and it was a completely different conversation from anywhere else I had ever been. Um, they, they were focused on developing my idea, developing my, my skill sets of what I was good at and plugging me into the things I wasn't so good at. <laughs> um, they also introduced me to different programs that were involved at the, the Ann Arbor Spark location, both in Ypsilanti and here, to network with other people that had those kinds of skill sets. Um, they, they offered certain funding to me as well to help me start to create the actual idea and bring it to the, the MVP stage along with the work with the, the other individuals I, I interacted with in the process. Um, after that, I got involved in the um, Ann Arbor Spark Boot Camp program, where I actually went through the entire program, ended up winning it, so I got the trophy. Um, and I also got the opportunity to develop more within the community of Ann Arbor Spark. Um, from there, I went from being downstairs to in a cube to myself plus three employees in the stage two. Um, so, we're continuing to grow, we're actively seeking new employees, and you know, really appreciate all the opportunities that we've been given throughout the process. And so, any other questions? Thanks, yeah. So we just thought it would be good to hear kind of a real world, um, you know, there's, this is a company that's been helped by the program, and uh, I always like hearing that, and think it can be helpful just to see the benefit of the service. So this slide depicts the tax capture. So obviously there's actual capture and then there's a projected capture. I think the main point and what stands out here is that the value is increasing. I think that's just like uh, the DDA capture is increasing. It's due to the downtown development that's going on. And so that increase is allowing for a greater capture. And we'll talk about, I think on our last slide a little bit, as to what the plan may be for that, and it, it, it's under review. So a snapshot of the fiscal 2013 financials. Again, you have this in your package. You know, I won't read these line by line. I think uh, a question did come up on the business accelerator support services line item, which I don't think the, um, this has a pointer, but or there's, these two numbers, the 862 and the 977, 893, there was a question as to whether that was a permissible increase. And yes, the LDFA reviewed those while we were in session and we approved an increase there. So there was no uh, breach of any contract or anything like that. So I just want to make sure that that was clear. And 
again, on this slide, the highlight is the ending fund balance and what the LDFA plans to do with the increase there. Some of the metrics here, I think, are, are useful. And you can see there are 70 companies that receive these services. And again, when you take it back to what the smart zones were formed to do, and that's the acceleration of businesses and high technology and diversifying the area as economy, I think the fact that there were 70 companies that received these kinds of services is, is great. And these companies were the beneficiary of it. They were able to grow in the area, and the hope is that they can grow more, right? And that there'll be more than 25 jobs. But this just gives them that start down the path to be more successful. So 70 companies received the services. There's um, 24 companies that used the entrepreneurial boot camp. So a highlight for this is the fact that the, the entrepreneurial boot camp that Spark runs is actually state recognized. And so other smart zones in the area, in the state of Michigan, send people to learn about the program. They think it's, you know, uh, 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 that great that they should have their smart zones uh, copy the same type of plan. So that's a, a plug for the entrepreneurial boot camp. There were 45 tenants in the incubator, so that's the, the incubator space over at Spark Central, over on Liberty. So again, it's downtown. People can be downtown. They can you know, walk around downtown. They can visit some of the new restaurants and, and, and um, go to, walk to the bank, and they can take the bus, and they can ride their bike. So that was a big um, selling item. People really want to be in that incubator space. There were two loans made through that microloan program. There were other loans made in the area, but that was um, Spark leveraging state funds. So there, there were more than just the two loans, but um, the loans that were made were through funds that were recaptured or repaid. So there's no longer a, a, a monies being distributed towards the loan program. There's just self-funding. And then last but not least, there were 88 educational programs and events that were hosted. So some of the types of programs that are hosted are, you know, how do we form our business? Should I become an LLC? Should I be a corporation? I mean, it walks people through that. They have accountants that come in and talk to people about how you should start your books and records and keep your books and records and, you know, go talk to a tax advisor for certain things. It just really gets people started down the path of operating the right way. Um, we, there was a, a presentation hosted on securities law recently where it helped companies that are trying to raise money navigate some of the new laws that have come out. A lot of these startups don't have money to engage a lawyer, and so these are programs that can help them at least learn what they're supposed to be doing, and then they can maybe go research it or talk to somebody with a little bit more information. So, so to finish, we are planning for the future of the LDFA. Our term ends 2018. We have possibilities to extend the term by five years and 15 years. Those are uh, both things that there's a strategic committee of the LDFA, and they're reviewing those uh, with the full board, with the MEDC, and then with others. So those are um, planned for. I would suspect that the five-year extension would likely happen, and we'll have to see about the 15-year. They're, um, they're still looking into that. In terms of the use of any uh, funds that are that have uh, grown through the capture, the strategic committee is also looking at that. So obviously, under the statute, there's certain things that the funds can be used for. So it can be um, expansion of services. There could be capital improvement um, types of things, and then you know capital infrastructure needs, as, as we list out there. So those are all still under review. There, the strategic committee met last week, and then we'll be meeting again soon to discuss those further. And so I'm sure we'll, we'll have further updates on it. But there are plans underway. We have several years to go, but we wanted to get started now thinking about what the future looks like. So with that, uh, I can come to an end, unless there's any questions. Sure. Um, you mentioned uh, the terms are 2018. What would happen to the $2 million in tax capture? Would it go back to the DDA or go back to the taxing authorities? It's my understanding that it goes back to the state. The state? It's state money. So if, if we are not capturing it through the LDFA and using it here in Ann Arbor, it's going back to Lansing. So. Yeah, that's my recollection as well, part yeah. of the smart zone legislation. Yeah, it's, hard, it's cumbersome to read through. I've read it through now multiple times, but that's, that's my takeaway. I've talked to um, 
lots of people about it. That's the what the LDFA plan says. So it's. At first, I was skeptical. You know, I have, I've got three kids in Ann Arbor Public Schools. You know, I want to make sure that they're getting what they need. But it's not money that would otherwise be diverted to our schools. So. Council Member sure. Kelly Spock. So this fund is not that goes to state school, school fund? Any, any funds that are captured yeah. are reimbursed by the state. And so th that's, it's reimbursed through the state. It is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or get, people say that it's guaranteed by the state. That's another way I've heard it termed. I have one other question. Sure. Since the TIF capture is within the DDA area in Ann Arbor, why do we have three uh, out of nine members from Ypsilanti? That's what the LDFA plan that was signed back in 2002 calls for six people from Ann Arbor and three people from um, Ypsilanti. So. It was in the organizational documents of the entity. So was there supposed to be TIF capture in Ypsilanti as well? They have originally? the possibility to do it. It's not required, but mm -hmm. they can do it. Okay. So, but funds aren't used in Ypsilanti. So Ann Arbor funds are captured, but there's no Ann Arbor funds used in Ypsilanti. So all the funds are used within Correct. Ann Arbor? Correct, in Ann Arbor. Okay. Thank you. So. Councilman Long. Thank you. Um, you mentioned yeah, we're coming up on 2018, and um, since we're just a few years away from that, you also mentioned that there's a um, the strategic committee is mm -hmm. meeting now and and looking at uh, the plan for uh, the next five years and, and potentially beyond. I'm, I'm just wondering um, what you see as the sort of the next generation smart zone. If it's you know more continuation of what we're doing today. Or, or something radically different? I'm probably not the best person to ask, or answer that question. I don't know, you know, well, I'll turn one, that to the law. One issue for us is, is that in the legislation that the uh, legislature passed, which I guess, Kip, is what, a year ago, August? Um, teeing this up, um, they put a variety of stipulations in it. Mm. And so what part of the investigation is, is how can we fit within that stipulation? So they're allowing an extension of time. They're allowing an extension of geography. Um, uh, you could make it a bigger zone. But the one prerequisite to get to 15 years is that any community that wanna, would want to do that would have to enter into a, uh, a creation of a satellite zone in an adjacent community. And so part of what we're exploring is, is that element of uh, who potentially uh, would be a partner uh, to do that. But that is a prerequisite that the states put forward. Now, again, the way that would work is that any tax capture that happened there would be spent there and resources in Ann Arbor wouldn't be transferred there. But the state is looking to take the expertise that the individual smart zone has and try to broaden it uh, into adjacent adjacent communities. So that's that's what we have to explore. Five years, we don't have to have a satellite to get to mm -hmm. 15. Um, we would have to figure out that satellite process. And that community would have to be willing to cap do take the TIF capture. Okay, thanks. Yeah. No, I mean, and to the extent that they're gonna provide different services, I mean, I think at the time we'd evaluate it, yeah. so. And then just another one, if I may. Um, <clears throat> when we met on this um, a year or so, or so ago, we received a LDFA presentation um, and, and Spark. Um, a, a top priority on the LDFA side um, uh, was to establish metrics um, to analyze the effectiveness in terms of the LDFA spend. And for fiscal year 13, according to the, the data that's been provided, we spent one and a half million um, and 69 new jobs were created. And I mean, I don't know if that's good or bad, you know, $20,000 a job. I mean, intuitively, we all certainly support the concept of, of funding, economic development, have great respect for the work that Spark does. Um, but having said- I think you said, also have to look though, right, that there were 70 companies that were touched. Okay, right? it's so. si that, that 69 new so jobs. Which, which they will be expanding, right? So they might be in early stages now, 
but okay. the goal is that they're growing. So okay. I mean, it just seems like a lot of money for 69 jobs. Well, I mean, I, I, it's it's the, the, the it's history, difficult work that you're doing. Yeah, yeah, the history of the program to date is that there have been 535 jobs that have been created, and that's a net figure. That's companies. You know, we're at an early stage with companies. Um, and that's just since 2006. Six. Um, but what, what we want to reinforce, at least from Spark's perspective as your contract entity in this, is this is an effort to create companies. We are trying to diversify the economy across a variety of technologies. As these companies grow, they will create more jobs. But the point at this point is we're, this isn't a job creation program. This is a company creation program. Well, there is also a standard, Paul, and you may recall what it is. Um, about economic development per job, and I think that that's actually a pretty good number yeah, based for, on yeah, that well, for national our, standard. You know, we didn't, I didn't raise that, and that's in my earlier presentation. Um, there's, there's the difference between the LEFA resources and the resources that come from the general fund. Um, the, the impact for um, Ann Arbor is over the period of time it's invested in Spark. The total is $550,000. The amount of investment that's happened is $383 to every dollar that uh, mm -hmm. has been invested. And the ratio on the job creation for the investment you make directly in Spark is about $112 per job. So um, the impact of your investment from a general fund perspective is in mature companies that are creating lots of jobs, and jobs immediately. This program is to create the companies of the future. That's what, that's what it's about. So mm -hmm. we do both. We work with the companies that are here, that are hiring and growing now. We're also trying to create who's going to be the next company that's going to do major hiring. Okay. Well, those, those are great numbers. And I, you know, but I, I will, just, will just say, I, can, I continue to believe, uh, though, that, um, that work does need to be done around the ROI and the effectiveness of, of the spending. Um, and... I mean, we've talked about this a bit before, and um, and I I know Mr. Crawford sitting there. I mean, you seem to agree with this when this came up previously. So I'll just put that out there. Councilmember Greer, this is nearly a philosophical question. Um, in your presentation, you passed over the fact that your budget for this year, this past year, included microloans, but that the line item for microloans indicated a zero. Mm -hmm. um, in your presentation, you, you actually almost mentioned why that might be, but I'd like you to explain it a little bit better. Why it's zero in why the budget? Why it's zero? Oh, I thought I said, maybe I wasn't clear. It's zero because we don't allocate funds in the budget towards it because it's self-funding now. So as loans are repaid to the microloan program, those are the, the funds that are being reloaned. We're not allocating extra funds towards that program. Yes, I understood that, but I'm not certain um, that it was clear. So thank okay. you very no, much for explaining. Sorry if I wasn't clear. 